so I've always had problems with fibroids. Um, I've known about them for at least eight years. Um, and it wasn't an issue until my last pregnancy that I, it, the fibroid grew to a point where I could actually palpate it from the outside. So we, um, we on our own went to a, a gynecological oncologist. Uh, my husband had gotten a recommendation from one of his colleagues that said he was the best, you know, bar none, he, this is the person you need to go see. So we went and saw him um, and he said basically, oh, this is completely normal fibroid behavior. Um, there's no reason to be concerned. The only reason I'm really seeing you is as a professional courtesy to your husband. Um, you do not have cancer. I had an MRI, had ultrasounds, I had biopsies. This is completely normal fibroid behavior. What I needed was a, a, new, a conventional gynecological surgeon and recommended uh, me to one of his colleagues. He said he would have this done laparoscopically. Um, I said, I have no vanity, I've had six children, whatever is easiest, safest. I was very clear on that and the last thing he said to me was, no surgeon in their right mind would do this to you open. Um, there's no reason to. You should have this done laparoscopic. So I went to um, one of his colleagues. I had the laparoscopic hysterectomy on October 17th and um, eight days later on October 25th I received a phone call um, from her saying uh, the pathology came back as lyomyosarcoma. We got in touch with the same gynecological oncologist that I had seen preoperatively, and he said, look, this is just really, really rare, one in 10,000 women. Um, you just really struck out on this. I said, what does this mean? Do I, well, I, you know, what do we do next? He says, well, we'll send you to an oncologist. Some women, you know, we go back and take out their ovaries. Some don't. Some women go in and look around in eight weeks to see if anything's growing. Some don't. Um, some do chemotherapy. Some don't. Um, he was just very vague. He said, it's just so rare we don't know what to do with these women. Um, and that's kind of how we left it. And so while I was talking to him, my husband was frantically trying to get on a plane to come back up. Um, and he spoke with my gynecological surgeon and basically said, how did you do this? And she said, well, I morselated. And um, I didn't know really what that meant. Um, but it turns out when they more sleep, they just it just shreds the tissue in the abdominal cavity. And we said, well, what does that mean for me and my cancer? And the obvious answer is it spread. She was reassured by a gynecological oncologist. You know, her and I sat in the office with this second gynecologist, and you know, she basically you know talked to us and said, you know, she's going to do it laparoscopically. You know, standard risks are bleeding, infection. You know, maybe some adhesions. Uh, you know, there's a small possibility of bowel injury. Nothing about morselation. It's certainly, you know, from a general surgeon's perspective, which is what I what I trained as, um, morselation is something that that I you know, was like a historic practice in general surgery where people with enlarged spleens were subjected to. And it wasn't even on my radar screen. Um, and uh, certainly we were not informed during that session where we signed the informed consent form that, that this was, this was what's, what's going on. October 17th, Amy had her operation at the Brigham. Everything went very smoothly. Um, you know, she was, she was out the same day, got out of the hospital at, by 5 p.m., I think it was the same day. Uh, two days later, she was up on her feet, and I went back down to Duke on, I think it was the 24th of October, after just, you know, helping around the house a little bit to make sure everything's okay. Uh, the next morning, I was in the operating room, I got a phone call uh, from her, and then subsequently the gynecologist basically telling me that they had, um, they, they had found leiomyosarcoma. And at that point, my immediate question, you know, as a general surgeon, thoracic surgeon, is if you have a sarcoma, you know, I know you haven't done a cancer operation, but please tell me at least you got it out in one piece, because that's the, so that's the, that's the biggest thing you, you're concerned about, that if you disrupt the mass, you know, it's like a bee's hive. If the, if, you know, if you start chopping it up, the bees will spill all over the place and you're, you're in trouble. But, um, you know, so, so she, at that point she said, no, you know, I, uh, we morselate. And I just, I mean... To, to me, like as soon as she said that, that was like a five alarm fire. I mean, I, it was, it was like the, the translation for me was about 30 seconds or so, uh, where, what do you mean you morselate? And then, um, you know, I sat there, I sort of processed, you know, she told me they use morselators. I was like, wow, morselator? What's, what's a morselator? I mean, I, I didn't even know, you know, after seven years of general surgery at Penn and two years of cardiothoracic surgery training at, at the Brigham, I didn't even know a morselator existed, frankly, because we just don't use it. You know, at that point, I'm just like thinking to myself, geez, you know, this is, this cancer is spread. I mean, we have to assume that this cancer has spread. Um, that's sort of how you have to play this game because, 
you've taken leiomyosarcoma, you've morselated it, you've spread it all over the place, and now you're telling me we can wait and watch. To me, that was completely untenable. Um, and then in the airport, I, I, I read a little bit about morselator devices, and I realized, like, this was like within the span of two hours. I realized that this is like a massive thing that we're looking at, that they're doing this routinely. I had no idea, like well, systematically. Yeah. And the scope of the problem for me was pretty well defined within two hours of when it happened. So um, the, the original surgical oncologist we saw preoperatively and spoke to postoperatively was the one who published the largest um, case series to date on women who'd had morselation of their leiomyosarcomas and said not only was the frequency much higher than originally estimated, the one in 10,000 numbers that they were quoting people, including myself, but also that the outcome following morselation um, was much worse than had they kept contained within the uterus. Um, so yeah, I, I you know the thing that's really struck me about this whole thing that was after all this had happened, um, you know, I went back and I started looking at what the implications of this are, and I realized that the gynecological oncologist at the Brigham, who who, who I had sent my wife to, Dr. Muto, was a co-author on the largest series which to me was just striking. I mean, I, you know, and, and then I looked at his paper and, you know, they, everyone was quoting this one in 500, and one in uh, 10,000 10, number. And, and I realized that when, when you actually look at his own paper, that, that paper from, uh, I think Seidman is the first author on that paper in, in, um, in PLOS uh, 1, um, when you look at the numbers, it looks more like a one in 500 incidence because when you say one in 10,000, you're using the entire population of women in the United States. You're not using the subset of women who, who are, who are door, knocking on the gynecologist's door with problematic fibroids. So, so that's a problem, right? I mean, they're, they're using the wrong denominator. In their minds, they have this 1 in 10 to 20,000 number. But the fact is, of the women who walk into the office, it's really like the, the frequency is probably about 20 times higher than what they were assuming. The, the scope was very clear. I mean, uh, a symptom, if you're a woman and you have symptomatic fibroids, um, there is a one in somewhere in 400, the FDA says 350, one in 350 to 1,000 chance that you have a, an occult cancer. That's high, huge. So um, that's where we are. That's, that's, where we, uh, that's what happened to us. So, so in response to the news, initially, um, I, I, I think I did one Google search on my myosarcoma and it pulled up uh, five-year survival curves, and that was the last time I looked at anything having to do with myosarcoma for probably three or four months. Um, I, I sort of, I, I went off into my own sort of shell and kind of had to deal with it. Um, Human very much threw himself into um, the logistics of, you know, finding out what we should do in the next step. I mean, he was incredibly helpful. He kind of plugged in right away. Um, as well as starting to understand how big of a scope this problem was, not just for me, but for hundreds of women. Um, and like you said, that became pretty clear pretty quickly, um, but initially it was about me getting the second step in treatment. Number one was that, um, uh, you know, my wife was in trouble. I mean, she, it was like it was like a five alarm fire. I mean, that's, that's basically the, the way my mind sort of uh, formed around this was we were dealing with like a five alarm fire, you know, so they just, they just basically spread an aggressive cancer inside her belly and they created a stage four cancer. They, they took her from an early stage contained cancer that's curable to, you know, a cancer that could potentially get us into big trouble. So my, and, and then, and then as I sort of understood what it is that they were doing, I sort of realized that, you know, wow, she's probably not alone. I mean, this is, this is like, if they're doing it like this and they have these devices that they're using to do this and they're doing it so indiscriminately, it has to be much bigger than just her, you know? And so my first goal became to, you know, get her out of trouble. So the damage control part of it was the first part. And, you know, I, I, I frankly was very fortunate because I trained at the Brigham. And at the Brigham, there's uh, a professor, David Sugarbaker, who, um, you know, is, is probably one of the leading thoracic surgeons in the country, he is one of the leading thoracic surgeons in the country. And his brother, Paul Sugarbaker, is in Washington, D.C. And these gentlemen have championed this concept of local chemotherapy for the spread of cancer. So uh, after discussing it with a couple of my colleagues um, um, and with Dr. Sugarbaker, um, we, we very quickly made the decision that Amy needs to go through the Sugarbaker procedure down in D.C. And so we, within, within a couple of days, we were down in D.C. We met with Dr. Paul Sugarbaker. He gave us some very uh, sobering um, numbers, but he also said that if this is early stage enough at this point, 
uh, I can probably guarantee you guys that after my operation, you know, we will be able to contain this so that you don't have local growth anymore. It's a big operation. It took nine hours. You know, we were down in Washington, D.C. Uh, very hard on her. She had a pulmonary embolus on her first uh, night after the operation. Uh, and, and, you know, we basically clawed our way out of there in 10 days. And then after that, she started her chemo. So, you know, I'm not a gynecologist, but they're saying they do about 600,000 uh, hysterectomies a year. And about 100,000 of these hysterectomies and myomectomies are being done with morselation. And if the rate's really 1 in 400, you know, you can do the math. It's like 100,000 divided by, say, 500, right? That's, that's 200 women. That's like two jetliners filled with women getting into serious, deadly trouble, you know? And, and to me, that was like, you know, that was like simple math, you know? And I, and I tried. I tried to sort of take this to a variety of different people. But the response was very blunted. I mean, you know. I, I mean, you know. I mean, what we thought, or at least what I thought would happen. I mean, we're physicians. Um, we are. We put our patient safety front and center. We have campaigns for patient safety. We make up titles for patient safety advocates. We fly banners about how safe we are as hospitals. We thought that when we took this back to the hospital that I had been operated on, and said, "Look, this happened to us." We found out that there was a, another woman who was dying of this very thing. Um, she had had leiomyosarcoma, she was young, she had been morselated, and she subsequently died from it a couple months later. She was dying when I had my operation. So I was not the first person. And so we, we thought that when we go to the hospital and say, look, here's a patient safety issue, um, you guys need to stop doing this, um, that they would say, of course. And that was, it was, they absolutely did not have that response. Their response was, um, we're very sorry this happened to you. And um, we really can't discuss this, you know, we're dealing with this internally, right. um, thank you very much. Suppose you're a woman and you have this cancer in there, you know, and suppose the doctor says, you know, if you have cancer and we morselate, it'll spread. Um, but, you know, your chances are very small. Well, Most we, patients accept... But we don't think you have cancer. You we don't can't have, cancer. have it both ways. Right. Because as the as a patient, you trust your physician. If your physician says, I don't think you have cancer, then right. why not do so, it? So, 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 you know, so informed consent doesn't really protect the patient. It protects the doctor and the hospital from liability. Now, you know, the Brigham and Women's Hospital looks really good in the, in the media now. They stopped the uh, procedure before the FDA advisory. They put the informed consent thing in initially. I mean, but, but all those came after an extreme degree of pressure from us. I mean, we, we uh, were just going all out with the publicity. Uh, I was really sort of very vocal about this because I knew that with the numbers that they were proposing, this was hitting one or two women a day somewhere in the United States. And, and, I, and I recognize, you know, Harvard Medical School is one of the most distinguished and prestigious hospital medical centers in the, in the world. And so if Harvard comes out and says something, it, it'll ripple through the entire world, frankly. And so I, I have an utmost degree of respect for that institution and for the, for the great majority of the physicians who are there and scientists who are there. I think they're top-notch. It's a top-notch institution. They've managed to look good in the media right now. Um, but it's taken, it took an unbelievable amount of force and, uh, you know, it took me and my wife taking a pretty big hit. So here's the deal. Um, when you cause stage four cancer in a woman and you take her prognosis from, a, you know, 80 to 90% survival rate at five years and you drop it down to 10 to 15% survival in five years, which is the difference between the stages, that's a five alarm fire. Now, if any of my colleagues want to stand on ceremony on that, they're welcome to. But the fact of the matter is that if at a rate of one or two women a day across the United States, according to the statistics, these group of surgeons are causing um, a mortality hazard for their patients that's completely avoidable, um, I don't think standing on ceremony is the right thing to do. So, so the, the, the people who, are, uh, who, who critiqued me on my tactics, I, you know, look, man, I, I would do the same exact thing if I went back again. I mean, this is, this is, this is people's lives. And, and, and as, as the scope of the problem became more apparent to me, how many women have been harmed, how many people have, been, have died, you know, it just, for me, it was very, very clear what's happening here. And, and, you know, the fact that I was personally affected by it maybe made me a little bit more vocal. But you know what? I think all my colleagues should have been vocal, too. Because this was a clear wrong. This was, this was, there's nothing right about this. I mean, you know, you, you take a meat grinder inside someone's belly and there's a cancer there and you haven't made any effort to look for a cancer. You have no idea whether there's cancer there and you're willing to say, you know, it's one in 350. Hell, even if it's one in, one in 10,000, man, you know, even if it's one in 10,000, whose mother are we going to cho choose? Whose sister are we going to choose? Whose wife are we going to choose to put through that? I mean, know? I think you have to realize, I think you have to really grasp how serious 
what morselation actually does to these outcomes. And people say, oh, you had cancer anyhow, which is true. Um, but now my cancer is much worse because of what you did. Um, the critics who say he's gone too far or crossed boundaries, I, I liken it to, say you walk past a car in a parking lot and there's a child inside and it's 90 degrees outside. You could call the police, you could call AAA and wait for them to come, or you could break a window. Um, because it's that serious, the consequences of what you're doing. So in, whereas breaking a car window of a complete stranger might be poorly frowned upon and be seen as boundary crossing, I mean, the, the, the effect of these surgeries is so bad, is so hard on these women. And keep in mind, these are elective surgeries. I didn't need to have my surgery done last year. If there was an argument about morselation, I could have waited. I've had these fibroids. Yeah, these are this. completely elective and avoidable operations yeah. for the most women, part. I mean. Women, yes, they're, they're bleeding, they have issues, they need surgery, but they don't need it when the techniques are under question for safety efficacy. And, you know, and I think that's what made us shout all the louder because women were volunteering to lay on operating room tables to have this done. And while we're saying this is dangerous, if I could tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, this might spread cancer, I guarantee many of those women would say, I'll wait. I'll wait a year, two years. Uh, you know, I'll be honest with you. I mean, I, you know, I, felt, I felt extremely disappointed in my own profession because this is very clear cut. You know, there's a group of surgeons that is, you know, without knowing whether there's a cancer present or not. And you know? I think it's also the delay and the consequence. I think if women with, um, you know, these cancers were dying right there on the operating table, the surgeons would feel it, the hospitals would feel it, the families would acutely point the finger at the surgeon at the hospital. If it had that immediacy of consequence, then this would have, this would be a non this would be not an issue. But because they then hand us off to oncologists who treat us and see the long-term sequelae of their actions, that's what's made it easy for them to be like, well, is this really an issue? Because they're not seeing, they're, they're not seeing people dying right in front of them admit the minute they do. I certainly was not polite about this. No. I certainly crossed lines that I probably, prior to this, would never have dreamt of crossing. Um, but I, and I did cross them because we were personally affected. Now, being personally affected, I've been criticized that this guy is personally affected and so he's, his judgment is compromised. I would argue that because we're personally affected, we actually have the best judgment on this. You know, in I, fact, it's not the only time in history where people who've been affected by something that's wrong have more clarity on it than people who are looking at it from the outside. You know, this, is, this was a clear wrong. And, and, and every Nick about it, the Brigham and women put a ban on it so early because they were personally affected by it, by us. So, I mean, you need to have that intimacy and tie to it to move quickly on these sorts yeah. of things. I mean, you know, in the medical profession, we have a very easy time putting walls around us, you know, and saying, oh, that patient's crazy, that patient's a little bit compromised, that patient's upset, you know. Well, we were upset. Um, yes, absolutely. My wife was just given stage four cancer. You know, I was I was angry. You know, but I also knew exactly what I was looking at. I was looking at a systemic act of ignorance on the part of a specific group of surgeons who had built an entire industry on this. I mean, this is the, you know this was people's lives. And and as time went on, you know, as I communicated with more and more of these families who were affected, I started to realize, you know, it's Amy Reed one day. It's Linda Interlichia another day. It's Meredith Hammond another day. And these people have lives, and these lives get devastated. And that's not acceptable. Now, if my critics want to say that my tactics were not acceptable, you know, I have a couple of expletives for that, but I'm not going to use it in this interview. The gynecological surgeons have adopted this practice, which any general surgeon, any thoracic surgeon, uh, anyone who's done any kind of training in general surgery would look at and say, this is not right. You know, um, and the reason why they're doing that is because, in my opinion, they train in a silo. Now, that's not just an opinion, that's a fact. General surgeons never see, in their ACGME residency programs, never see any gynecologist, gynecological residents, except for maybe two weeks in an ICU rotation. The only time we interact with each other in the operating room is when we get consulted because there's a complication of some sort. Or we consult them because there's a woman who's pregnant. But the fact is that these specialties are completely separated. So here's what's happened as a result. As a result, the gynecologists are making the assumption of benignity when it comes to uterine fibroids, right? And that's not an assumption that any general surgeon would make. In a 30-year-old breast woman, the frequency of a breast mass being cancer is roughly the same. It's slightly higher, less than 1%, but it's slightly higher than of a woman, a 30-year-old with problematic fibroids having myomyosis. Yet, yet, yet a breast surgeon would never make the assumption that that thing is benign until 
it's proven otherwise. So in other words, it, the pain, painstaking uh, act, efforts are made to biopsy, needle localization biopsy, core needle biopsy, ultrasound, MRI, and you know, mammograms. And no under conditions would they just chop it up inside the breast. Right. In all cases, they would remove it intact. Right. Um, they often do preoperative diagnoses, but even if that's negative, they would still remove it intact. But, but, but fundamentally, I mean, I think, I think if, I, if I had to frame it for you, is that, is that look, you know, if an entire field is making an assumption of benignity and approaching these tumors, you know, that, that is they're assuming that this, this thing is benign, you know, that opens up the door to adopting practices that would ca spread cancers in the minority subset of women who have cancers. And here's the deal, right? I mean, that's not how we practice medicine. We, we know, every single patient has to matter, you know? I mean, you know, there are things such as accidents, right? Accidents happen all the time, you know? I mean, surgeons create complications because of you know, errors in judgment, individual errors in judgment, technical errors in judgment. There are unavoidable complications that happen as a result of just opening someone up, like wound infections, like pneumonias, etc. You know, a surgeon could technically make a mistake, but this is not a mistake. This morselation is a fundamental routine that's been adopted because gynecologists make the assumption of benignity. If you, if you go to a plastic surgeon, your plastic surgeon has done three years of general surgical training. Gynecologists do zero general surgery training in their residency. That's not right. Well, look, I mean, 510K is basically, uh, it's a rubber stamp. I mean, there, there are two features of the 510K that are just, you know, <laughs> deadly flawed, and that's not me saying that. That's, that's the Institute of Medicine um, review saying that, right? Is number one is, you know, a device comes out from a manufacturer and, and they present it to the FDA, and all they need to basically show is that this is similar to pre-existing device, a predicate device, right? So that's, that's at the level of approval or authorization. And then later on, there's absolutely no real mandate or requirement for the practitioners in the hospitals to report poor outcomes back to the FDA or to the manufacturer. Now, there are mandates for reporting technical failures, you know, like if, a, if, a, if the device blows up, say, you know. That kind of thing probably does get reported. But outcomes in patients, similar to drugs, that doesn't happen. And, and so things could go under the radar screen. Complications go under the FDA radar screen. The signal intensity, if you will, is not strong enough for the FDA's radar screen to pick up complications like this. So for 20 years, these devices keep getting approved and reapproved and reapproved, different versions of it, and they're causing the spread of cancers, but no one has bothered to report it back to the FDA. You know, uh, and my understanding is up until November of 2013, when this happened to us, the FDA had not heard about this. So that's unacceptable. That's, that's, a, that's a failure in federal government. That's a failure in federal legislation. And what makes it even more shameful is that in 2011, a group of experts from the Institute of Medicine analyzed this uh, legislation, put it in front of the Senate Health Committee, but because the patient advocacy side of this argument was not strong enough, the United States Congress did not do anything about it. That's not acceptable, you know, because this is not some foreign enemy coming in and killing people. This is a piece of legislation in the United States causing a public health hazard that's killing people. Simple as that. So the ACOG is what most, the ACOG or similar societies is what most professionals look towards to define standard of care. Now it's not a, it's not a, it's, it's not something you can go after them. So for instance, they say morselation should be standard of care. It's not something we can argue with because it's their opinion and then physicians have to exercise their judgment, which has led us into this kind of strange circle. But um, so they've said, the ACOG has released in their statement that um, A, that physicians um, need to be trained in um, morselation to, uh, I think, uh, for t tissue extraction or something, tissue fragment finding or something very strange. So that was their one recommendation. And their second recommendation was that the FDA um, uh, collect a registry of patients who have been affected or patients who have this condition um, so they could better define the actual numbers. So I, in both cases, I'm not really sure why they've said this. So so firstly, um, morselation spread thing, spreads uh, cancer on a microscopic level. So I'm not sure where they're going with that angle protecting women at all. And secondly, in terms of a registry, I think we know that this frequency falls somewhere between one in 350 and one in 1,000. And I think even the ACOG would agree with that statement. Um, so, you know, in medicine, we, for instance, if we have a medication that treats some 
some condition. If we have a medication that we think works a little bit better, no one is going to fund studies to prove something works a little bit better, a little bit worse. No one's going to put money out to tell us what we already know, I suppose. And so I'm not sure why they're interested in expending effort in better defining the exact frequency rather than addressing the cause of the problem, which is their surgical technique. So I guess that's, you know, my thought on the matter. I don't know if you have... I think... I, 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 look, I think it's an absolutely ridiculous, ridiculous suggestion, okay? This basically amounts to... this. What they're suggesting is to do a prospective registry of Women deaths from stage 4 cancer. So, so, so they're basically shedding uh, a shadow of doubt over the fact that morselation spreads cancer. Morselation spreads cancer. In medicine and in clinical trials, we stop clinical trials if there's one death, okay? I don't understand why anyone in their right mind, any professional organization consisting of, particularly of, of American doctors in the year 2014 would suggest that you should have a prospective database of women whose cancers are occult or missed cancers are spread using morselation in order to prove that this is a hazard when we already know it's a hazard look we created this collage of 30 women who were willing to put their names forward the wall street journal went after them confirmed their stories okay these women's cancers were spread by morselation okay my wife's cancer was spread by morselation okay the other woman who passed away at the brigham and women's hospital you know at the same time that my wife was was on the operating room table you know she was very real you don't need a database for that what you need is to take a good look at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself am i doing the right thing here they're not doing the right thing they are basically protecting an industry they're protect they're saving face they're trying to save face and they're trying to protect an industry neither of those are acceptable orientations what they need to do is to, they need with some degree of introspection and humility look at themselves and say look for 20 years we've been spraying cancers inside people's bellies at a rate of one in 350 to a thousand we've been devastating these people's lives we need to stop we need to reevaluate. We need to change. And we need to accept that we've done harm. So, say you do the registry, and the incidence is one in three ninety, one in eleven hundred. Let's say it's one in what, ten thousand. What, what is that? What what further information are you going to gather from that? I, I'm not sure what they're looking for out of a registry. It's it's a completely unacceptable argument. This is a systematic practice that spreads cancer at a rate of one in three fifty, according to the FDA, up to one in a thousand, according to the ACOG itself. Now. If the ACOG is willing to say, okay, we'll accept that risk if it's 1 in 10,000, I would suggest to the ACOG leaders to think about whether or not they would accept their own mother or their own wife to be that 1 in 10,000 person whose cancer will spread. And if their answer is yes, perhaps they shouldn't be practicing medicine. So there has been the definite argue, argument put forth that you know, so many people have benefited from doing it laparoscopically through the small incision that it sh that it should be um, a choice. It should be the women's choice, the woman's choice, whether or not to have this done. And <clears throat> so there there are two, I guess, issues embedded in in those in that thinking. Um, the the first is that um, the first is that whether or not you recognize this is a bad medical practice practice. In some way. So if if we if we work from that tenet that morselation spreading tissue randomly through the woman's abdominal cavity is a bad practice, then the second the, the second step from that is that should bad medicine be a choice for patients? And the obvious answer is no. Now the flip side of that is you're right, some people have escaped harm from morselation. A lot of people drive intoxicated and don't drop, drop, crash their cars but that's not a good practice and so it kind of brings us back but unless you first start with that tenant that this is a poor practice you can very easily oh well I got out of the hospital and I was willing to take that risk it, you, you shouldn't even get to that level the point is that it's dangerous it shouldn't be practiced so it shouldn't be a choice um, I, I mean, yeah, I mean I would I would echo the same thing I mean the two arguments that are being used that this is for the benefit of the majority and this is a woman's choice now I would respond to the benefit of the majority argument by saying look you know, it's for the benefit of the majority, but we're okay, we're, we're going to accept the collateral damage to a minority subset of women with occult or missed uterine cancers, at least not in the year 2014 in the United States. That's sort of not our, that's not, those are not our social values. At least it's not what we espouse, you know, uh, in theory, you know. Um, but and that's number one. And number two is this notion of women's choice, you know. Um, 
uh, bad medicine should not be a matter of choice, you know. And, and I think that it's unfortunate that a lot of these distinguished gynecologists are going and seeking out these women who are willing to come in and say, oh, I had this laparoscopic hysterectomy, went very well, I'm very happy. Yes, you know, Amy's operation went very well. She was out the same day, she was up on her feet two days later, and if she hadn't had cancer, everything would be honky-dory. It's not. And, and you know, uh, bad medicine should not be a matter of matter of choice. Yes, for, um, I mean there there are cases where there there are the rare plastic surgeons that will do these horribly disfiguring operations, giving these women enormous breasts, far outside of what's physiological, because the women ask for that. And across the board, everyone looks at these people and say, "Those are bad doctors. These that's bad medicine. That's hurting that patient. They shouldn't do that." So, and the same applies here. The same principle. Yeah. This is. This is not good medicine. When you go to your doctor, he's looking at you like you are the only patient that matters at that point in time. What's safest for you? The safest, again, we're not talking about get rid of laparoscopic surgery, which is another argument that they frequently say, that, oh, you're talking about getting rid of laparoscopic. We're, you're returning us to our mother's hysterectomy. I've actually heard those comments come out of women's mouth. And I say, no, I'm not. I'm saying make an appropriate size incision for the mass involved, as across all fields of surgery they do. If the, if the mass is this large, then, the, the incision needs to match that. You know, the, this sort of shortcut taking by laparoscopic morselation is what's gotten us here. And it's certainly a violation of a fundamental bedrock principle of medical ethics, which is called non-malfeasance, you know? That means that, you know, if I'm a doctor, if I'm a surgeon, and I'm looking at a woman or a person on my operating table, if I'm thinking about the benefit of the majority, as opposed to thinking about Mrs. Smith, or in this case, Dr. Reed, on my operating room table, then I'm committing malfeasance. You know, and that's not right. That's 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 not how we should practice medicine. It's not the absolute value of the risk, Matt. You know, I, you know, when we do cardiac surgery, we quote, you know, organ failure rates up to 10%. There, there are certain subset of patients where we would quote a death rate of 30%. If someone comes in with a ruptured aorta, for instance, their mortality rate could be upwards of 70%. It's not the absolute percentage that matters. What matters is that this is avoidable. This is completely avoidable. And you know what? Even if you stack up all the morbidities associated with you know, open hysterectomies. Let's say, let's say all the hysterectomies from this day on are done open. If you stack up all the morbidities and the unavoidable mortality that results from that, it's going to come nowhere near one in 350 to, to 500. Right, and I mean, there are plenty of examples of risks we take when we go into the operating room period. Um, wound infection, blood clots, and every single risk within our power has been minimized. So we give antibiotics to prevent wound infections. We put compression stockings, we give sub-Q heparin to prevent blood clots. Every, every risk that's out there, we take every step to avoid. This is something that's so avoidable through an incision that's just maybe a centimeter, two centimeters, three centimeters long. I mean, hell, they do elective cesarean sections, which is a full laparotomy incision for, cho for, for no reason. A woman can say, I'd like a C-section on this date, and they're okay with that incision, but I'm talking about a, small, uh, a, a couple of inches to spare one out of 350 women, terrible abdominal sepsis, and you know everyone throws the risk flag up. Well, what happened to all those women having cesarean section, incisions? How, why aren't people screaming about their I, mean, I, I think I think the cesarean section analogy is very appropriate, right? I mean, you know, hundreds if not thousands of women every day around the world are offered elective C-sections. We're not talking about emergency sections. There are women who have elective C-sections and these same group of surgeons are saying, you know, it's okay to offer this to them. Now, the C-section incisions, I don't know if you know or you're aware, but C-section incisions are very large usually. It's done under time pressure because you got to get the baby out there's a lot of bleeding there's nothing elegant about that operation you know to to to, to accept that risk you know in, in cases where and then say you know we're not willing to make like a uh, an incision that's maybe two inches larger on an elective case because we're worried that these patients are going to die of PEs that's that's sort of a defensive argument that's basically again designed to protect an industry you know not acceptable uh, I'll just say one thing I mean I'm optimistic I think that common sense will prevail. I think there's, um, it's human nature to resist change, and I think that's sort of what we're encountering. Countering. I, I think that um, I'm, as physicians, you know, we do want what's best for our patients, and I believe that the, even the GYNs who are morselating think that's best for their patient, and it will take time to push them in the direction of change, and maybe not even them, but the generations to come. So you can be sure that GYNs in training right now, this is on their plate, and it was not on the previous generations. So I think change will happen. Um, I, I mean, legally, if you want to speak to uh, that. Uh, uh, 
look, I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't think that any of this was a malicious thing. You know, I don't think any. You know, uh, we, we have, uh, you know, medical school classmates, friends who are OBGYNs, dear friends, you know, who are OBGYNs, and and uh, you know, we don't, you know, we're not. This is not a personal attack. This is just like this is an industry-wide act of um, ignorance. They were they weren't aware that this was such a risk. You know, they they weren't they hadn't thought about it critically enough. They hadn't really looked at it carefully. And unfortunately, an industry evolved around it. So so yes, change is hard, right? That's true. Um, but you know, starting sometime in November when this news got disseminated, I think that any GYN, any organization that resists this change is committing an act of medical negligence. It's very simple. You don't mince up people's tumors when you don't know there's cancer inside it. Because if you do, you'll, cook, you'll cause a stage four cancer. So, that's one thing. In terms of what will catalyze um, you know, cha real change, it's gonna have to be courage on the part of our legislators, you know? It's gonna have to be courage on the part of Senator Elizabeth Warren. It's gonna have to be courage on the part of Senator Al Franken. It's gonna have to be courage on the part of Tom Harkin, who come, in, come out and say that we are going to protect the public. We're gonna protect the people who can be victimized by fixing the federal legislation that governs this, you know? It takes courage on the part of leaders. If you have leaders who have courage, then change will come, everyone will be protected, even industry will be protected. You know, I think, you know, we don't want to frame this as like, we're not against industry. You know, we, we think industry is important. We think the healthcare establishment is one of the most prominent achievements of, of, of the United States, you know. We're part of it, you know. We're not arguing against the establishment. We're arguing against a specific mistake in a medical practice that has been potentiated by a specific mistake in federal legislation. It takes courage on the part of leaders to bring about that change and do it fast, you know? I mean, this has happened to us and we've provided them with a platform. It's up to them now. It's up to Warren, Franken, Harkin, Lamar Alexander. It's up to Peter Lorre. It's up to Margaret Hamburg to bring safety to this particular issue and to medical devices, period. This is not out of this world. This is something that's doable. We're not talking about, you know, sending a man to Mars. We're talking about changing federal FDA legislation to ensure that post-market surveillance happens, and we're telling GYNs to stop morselating tissues inside people's bodies. That's all. And frankly, because of us, I think it stands a chance. I think, you know, when the 510K legislation, when the 510K legislation was argued, there was no patient body representative. There was no force pushing it. It was more theoretical. And it's much easier, I think, to get caught up in many theoretical issues and just brush that aside as, you know, we'll deal with that. Whereas I think if there are actual faces in front of that campaign and there are women standing there, um, that they will have an easier time bringing about this change. It won't be just kind of, you know, a matter for discussion, but actually women's lives 